very, very, very good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. This is the NSSF Financial Literacy Program. This is when we have our monthly webinar. It's one of those days, one of those, uh, that Tuesday, that Tuesday we have once in a, in a month where we, uh, we group ourselves and get down and constitute ourselves into a class of money. This is the school of money, and I am Apollo Mboa, your very own and very only one headmaster, sir, for this school. I'm happy and privileged to run this school of money. As you know, we all learn about so many things, biology, science, everything that we learn in school, but no one ever teaches us money. Money is something that brings us to work. None of us is volunteering at their workplace. I speak so passionately at my work, but behind it there is money. But how who, 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 who teaches us about money? How to spend it? How to earn it? How to keep it? How to grow it? And as NSSF, we feel like it's part of our purpose to talk about money. Being the hugest, being the largest financial institution, it's only right that we speak about money. And yes, I can already hear people grumbling and saying, you already have our money, you're not giving it to us. Now you're talking about, the money we are talking about today is not the, N the money we have at NSSF. The money at NSSF has about 600 staff qualified, fully qualified, looking after it. So there is no cause for discussion on that money. We are going to talk about the money that is in your pocket. Every month you receive money. Every day you receive money. What have you done out of that money? Why we do this? It's an overstretch, but we feel like we need to do this because when we pay you your money, this is your money that we are keeping at NSSF, and it, you lose it. It's not that you have lost that money because we paid it at 55. It's because you have been losing money all your life. Every, since 23, from your first paycheck, you were getting money and losing money. So at 55, you are given a big check. You will just follow the trend of what you know. So this program is aimed at calling you out and saying, wake up, style up, and let's talk about money. D definitely, there is always a very, very good, uh, today I have a, a, a very good panel with me, and these are, uh, I, I am not. I am. I am not ready. I'm, I'm not. I'm not qualified to to introduce them. They will be introducing them later on. But just a few statistics. Then I will continue to, and and I'll leave your space and leave these experts to come and pound this. We continue doing this as NSSF, and we'll do it every month, every third Tuesday of the month, to talk about money. Because as NSSF, on an average, we pay out seventy billion monthly. But just last month alone. Uh, the statistics that I have that are updated, we have paid off 191 billion so far in just this month of November. When you look outside there in the economy, do you see that money? When we do not see that money, or we cannot account for that money, much as it is your money, we get worried. So we get to do this because we need to get into a space where we can account for this money. 56% of our members when they receive their money, decide to go to a household member or a relative and ask them, what can I do with my money? 56%. So you go to a housemaid and ask her, I have gotten money. What can I do with it? 95% of the working population, not just NSSF member, working population at retirement, only 5% of them are able to sustain a life they were having while they were in employment. 95% of them are encouraged to go back to the villages. They are encouraged to, uh, to go dig. They are encouraged to leave their uh, places of, 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 of they, have been, they have known for the last 30 years and then find another space. They have to drop in level. Ladies and gentlemen, that is, that is something we want to change. And it starts with you. So we do this to get, to get you financially aware. We do this to build you financially. We do this to expose you to the different options of the things you can do. And I'm very uh, careful with this word. The things you can do. Do not look at what NSSF can do for you, what the government can do for you, what your neighbor can do for you, but the, the things you can do to make sure that when you reach 55, when you reach 60, you have options. But before we continue, who do we have? I would like the back office team to kindly share with us that poll question. We would want our panelists to know who we have on call so that they at can articulate this topic properly. Our topic today is the risk, return, and age story. You've all heard about 
uh, get rich schemes where you they say there's no risk but you will get a hundred percent reward so these experts today will tell us is there a risk is there a reward is there an age element into this and of course when I call them experts I want to I want you to associate with them because all of us are have experience handling money each of us said handling money right from birth when we are given when you are just babies and we are made to hold that coin or hold that note so you've been having you have your years experience the years of living are your years of holding money but are you an expert that's the question so as the back office team if it is kind enough to share that poll question would not to know who you are are you male are you female what's your age group as the poll as they get that done allow me to to introduce our moderator for the day josephine karunji the name is uh, synonymous with celebrity covers she's a communications expert josephine is a content creator she's restless for impact she wants to create impact in the world i told you that we're bringing the experts to talk about this and for money you may not have seen her in the money world as an expert but she's an expert when it comes to human beings so josephine will run our show today uh, but before that i need to let her know who we have so we have uh, i think it's still going on going on going on in uh, let's let's stop it in one two three we can stop that so ladies and jo josephine uh, the people you are going to be addressing today uh, with this good panel that uh, only you are capable of, of introducing uh, if I could have those results please yes uh, pull them up a little the people you are addressing today thank you 68 percent 69 percent are males 31 percent are females the majority the majority are between 30 to 40 years with 43 percent followed by 20 to 30 years at 29 percent between 41 to 50 we have 18 percent and above 50 12 percent uh how close are they to withdrawing their benefits already withdrawn seven percent in the process eight percent one month to withdraw one percent less than five years to withdraw about two percent and the majority 82 percent have not withdrawn yet so uh, that is to help you uh structure your conversation and then one last poll uh, before we leave as nssf we've been talking about options options and we have been uh throwing you to the different service providers for options you can create options for yourself you can create options in the financial market in the in the informal sector you can create options for yourselves but we are asking as nssf we are also thinking of options and if we brought in these options would you take them this is a yes or no uh, i don't know if the back office team has uh, been able to relay that poll question yes or no if we have options for you uh if we have options for you would you take them yes or no would you take an additional product outside your mandatory nssf most of you are our members by mandate you didn't choose you found yourself you even thought your your employer was just stealing money until they told you it is coming to nssf so if nssf said something where you can you are the one to bring the money would you participate in it yes or no uh, and there is a uh, let's see the answers there and there's a, que a second question there what options would you take what options would be popular for you would be would it be the short term which we are going which we are thinking around the unit trust would it be a medium term with one that will allow you to take money between three to five to to ten years would you take the one the long term that will allow you to take money only when you clock 50 or would you take a products option a housing product option what options would you want to take kindly help us answer that question uh, that speaks to our internal development 
uh, we may not display the, the answers here, but it speaks to our internal development of the products. Thank you so much. Allow me at this point to invite Josephine to take us over into this discussion. Thank you so much. And Josephine, you can refer to me as Sir Headmaster Sir. Sir Headmaster Sir, yes, I, thank I you. would take that additional, uh, you said program? Yes. If NSSF offered it, I'm curious to know, are there additional programs they're already thinking about? Oh yes, uh, and this is to help us in our uh, development. We are thinking of, you always, allow me to use, to, 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 to just take two of your minutes. Three minutes, uh, one month down into COVID, everyone stormed NSSF, we want our money. So we are thinking, if there was a product that some people were saving into, that could allow them to take their money at short notice, that would be the option. We don't have to go to parliament. So we are thinking of a product around that, under unit trust. We're also thinking about a product that will allow you to take your money between three years. You can take it at three years for savings, five years, or 10 years. You may you make a choice. We are thinking of another product where you can take your money, only take your money when you clock 50. We're also thinking of a product where where we can give you a house, you rent it as you pay, that that payment of rent uh, uh, goes, par part of it goes to payment of the house. So those are products we are thinking about, but we are asking the prob public there, would they take it up? And the thought process is, you need to have options. So if you have those options, then you are, uh, you, you are wealthy. Sir, teacher, sir, you are dismissed. Headmaster. You, sir, headmaster, sir, you are dismissed. You can uh, <laughs> allow us to proceed with our panel. Thank you for that information. Uh, my name is Josephine Karunji, and I will be moderating this conversation on the risk, return, and aid story. Um, Apple was speaking about the qualified people who are minding your money, and I'm privileged to have on my panel this afternoon the guy who manages 80% of NSSF's portfolio. Ibrahim Buya, Portfolio Manager, NSSF, welcome. Um, I've always wondered, what's that feeling for you when you know that you're giving out this much money? Apollo mentioned how much you gave out this month. One, how much? 191 so far, I think. Okay. What's the feeling for you knowing this money is going out and you don't see a reflection of it when you look at the economy? All right, thank you so much, Josephine. Um, I think, first of all, it's exciting that we impact people's lives because that's the mandate of the fund. It exists to sort of um, come into someone's life uh, when typically they don't have much to turn to. The job has gone away. And this is the last pocket, also so pocket that you have to, to dip your hand into. So it's exciting. Um, and in any case, the 191, which was 217 last month, is, is, is the pleasure that we have when we give it out. So uh, initially, that's exciting itself. But long term, we want to see what the members do with this money, yeah? And that's why programs like this one have been started. I think our research shows that uh, some members do well, some don't do well, and that's the purpose of such schemes like this one, discussing with the members how to make them better over time. What's that feeling for you, Ibrahim, when people throw away that money? Ah, it's, um, it's, it's a terrible feeling because the idea is that you want someone to maintain their lifestyle, yeah, as they were when they were working and when they leave employment. So it's a bit heartbreaking, to put it precisely. So that's why we are doing this anyway, to All make right. them better. So Ibrahim is a chartered financial analyst with more than 10 years of experience in developing and implementing financial and investment strategies. He's adept at delivering strategic advice regarding financial and investment management across Uganda's financial sector. My second panelist is Livingstone Mukasa, who is the CEO, lead business advisor at Living Business Education. Livingstone is an author. One of his books is called The Great Financial Rebuild and the other is investing for the future. He is a seasoned entrepreneur, coach, and mentor. Livingstone, welcome. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you for having me on the panel. Thank you for organizing something, uh, uh, such sessions where we can be able to help inform our people. All right. Um, Livingstone, my first question to you, as reading about your journey, You've been in this business journey for a very, very long time now. Um, I, I don't know how far back we did, but starting with, I About think... About 20 years now. Yeah. Clean Consult was the beginning? Yeah, it was the beginning, okay. 2003. 
um, I'd like you to tell us a bit about yourself. Sometimes when people are watching and they're thinking, who is this guy in a suit telling me about business? You know, what right does he have to tell me about that? Uh, why should he tell me about risks that I can or cannot take? So tell us a bit about yourself. Uh, in, in my case, uh, as, a, as a living stone, literally it's defined by one word, and that's poverty. I was born in poverty, I grew up in, uh, in the slums of Katwe, and I, I came to hate poverty with a passion. And so I've been learning away. I've been putting as much distance between me and poverty. And my journey has been learning, it's only actually last year, that I stopped to reflect and I said, hmm, wait a moment, I've been learning away from poverty, maybe it's time to be rich. So, so my, whatever that I have done, whether I have built businesses for me to get something to feed my family or to offer a job, whether I have offered advice, whether I have written a book, is framed in one argument. How do we help our people build an economic progress journey? And so that when I come to a panel like this, that's what I am interested in because I've been privileged to have the information. I've been privileged to come from zero to something. I've been privileged to see those that have and those that don't have. And when you, we need to go out and tell our people that it's actually possible. That's who I am. I was um, listening when Apple was speaking about the people who are watching or listening into this conversation. 69% males, age bracket 30 to 40 years. Is this shocking? Is it a surprise? Is it the expectation that these are the people interested in this conversation? Uh, for me, it's not. Because our workforce, the formal sector, is primarily uh, dominated by the male because of, of education and the girl child dropping out of school. So the, that is not, uh, that I'm, I'm, not uh, I'm not taken, I, I agree that that's true. But also when you look at the age factor, by the time you are between 25 and 30, a lot of people are still thinking it's, life is still a joke, life is still a party. When you get 30 and you have your first baby and you, ha you, you have married, you, you married and lent is now on your bill, you start looking at money very, very differently. I could say, I woke up to seriously consider starting to invest at about 35. About 35. Yeah, I think... Um I think the same. I think the, that's the time when we pursue us in life, uh, trying to pursue risk. In particular, the males uh, research that they tend to pursue more risk than the ladies. So perhaps the wording of the topic is more attractive to them than than the other side uh, than the, the females. So that's the expectation. Yeah. Abraham, your 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 portfolio. Yeah. Um, what I just read about you in telling the audiences who you are, it tells me that you've been a part of a lot of people's journeys. Yeah. And I'm curious to know. The common mistakes that you've seen with people thinking investment and starting to act that thought out, yeah. what have been the common mistakes that you could speak to? Okay, so I think the first one that I could talk about is that people overestimate their ability to make money. That's the first one, yeah? It's a behavioral issue um, whereby uh, people think that give them money and they will easily multiply it, yeah? So there is that tendency, more so among the males, to assume they can easily make money and they don't go through some of the basics of life. Yeah, Once you get money, uh, you must have a plan, you must do this. and So they end up pursuing too much risk. That's the easiest. The second bit is where people extend their expectations about the income they're having now way into the future Yeah, and do not think about that there will be a time that they will need perhaps to turn into this pocket um, which is set aside or where they have some sort of preservation of what they've been accumulating. So people pursue the current, if it's good times, way into the future, yeah, forever. Sometimes even if it's bad, as he mentioned, it's a decision that you have to take to say, I'm going out of this situation by your own self. So there's a tendency to, for people to basically forecast the current forever and this is common and it hurts, it hurts people at the end, more so during the time as we shall see. So in those two, in those two big things, yeah, the overestimation of ability to make money and then the tendency to forecast the current way into the future tends to resonate other smaller mistakes, but those two would be the bigger things I, I, I talk about for now. Do you ever find that that thinking of um, the money I'm making every month mm -hmm. and people are not thinking, let me save or let me start a business because they're relying heavily on that when I turn 55, mm -hmm. 
NSSF has my money. Yeah. And that's the back pocket they are looking at. Yeah, possibly, yes. Um, I think in recent years, people have gotten a lot of confidence in the fund. Yeah. Uh, in the past, and Apollo says it a lot, is that people didn't believe they would be paid. Yeah. But there are so many success stories now, people who have been paid and succeeded. But I think it's a tendency of not understanding how to accumulate wealth. Yeah. Uh, because wealth is built, it's earned by yourself. And there must be cumulative decisions made over time that lead into your wealth status over time. If you make many wrong ones along the way, then you will not be wealthy at the end of the time. Yeah, There's what we call sand of living, living risk, where people actually live on more than what they are earning. So it's about someone taking um, an effort or a decision that I must create my level of wealth myself. Even if the NSF is going to come at the end of the years, at the, end, at the time when you retire, you, there are other things that you will need to have as a building block. The NSF is just a support of what you already have. All right. Yeah. So those are the things uh, what we are talking about today, yes. the investments that you can start on. I was reading a bit about you, Livingstone. Um, you were having a conversation with a lady called Sarah Namulondo, and you said there are many people looking to invest, but few avenues in which to invest. So I want you to expound on that. How do we, um, who are looking for investors, find them? And how do we position ourselves well enough to be considered? Uh, uh, thank you, Josephine, for that question. But I, I need to frame this particular question from the word go, that if you're going to participate in the economy, you need to own capital. And there is a tendency for people to look at income and look at that pipeline continuing to come. Like you look at your salary and you, do, you can't imagine when you'll be fired. So that creates a problem. Because when you have income, you don't have capital. You only have your labor and the time you're selling in the market. So the only way you can create income for you to become an investor is when you live below your means. Not within your means, not above your means. So if we take out that one, and the second one is, is that the income you have today is actually not all for consumption. It's not supposed to buy you the necessary basket of goods for today. There is a bit of that income that you need to be able to put away for the future. So if you earn income when you are 30 or you are 25, you are 25, you are 30, part of that money is supposed to be for your black hair, but it's supposed to go for your gray hair. So we, now that also ties into the equation. And then you also have to understand that it's a learning process, that you're not going to wake up and start taking bigger chunks of risk when you couldn't manage a small chance, if you can't be able to risk one million shillings, what makes you think you could risk 10 million and get out alive? So now when we look at our people trying to find where to invest, it speaks on those factors that I have mentioned, that the areas where to invest in this market are primarily four. Nobody's going to tell you anything beyond where those four areas. And the four areas are you either an entrepreneur, and therefore you can be able to invest in a business, or find a business you can invest in. That's number one. And that also could all pick up the, the stock market by buying shares into someone, someone else's business. The other one is what my friend here, Ibrahim, is managing, the fixed income market. You're looking at treasury bills, you're looking at bonds. You are essentially uh, giving money to someone to manage for you with a future point of return. So those are the fixed market. And perhaps the other class of assets would be what you find with insurance companies and, and the product they give you, life insurance, with a bit of endowment. And lastly is real estate. Those are the four areas we have in this market. So if you're going to choose, you need to choose, like we say, you need to choose your poison pill and see how to manage it. Those are the areas where you need to be able to invest. But it starts by how much you have, what the time frame you have, and I, I think this is the discussion. And then, critically important, your risk appetite. If there is one thing I tell my people, and whoever that listens to me is that, never invest somewhere where you can't sleep well at night. We're going to get into the risk appetite a little later. Um, when we look at that age bracket that we have of 30 to 40, Ibrahim, what's your ideal portfolio in that bracket? So I think um, looking at the fund as a fund, um, that's where most actually their balances are growing, yeah, uh, as savers of the fund. Um, you would, the numbers could be that the percentage is a bit high because most of our members, in terms of wealth, is 31 to 45. That's where the biggest chunk, over 55% of the balance is. So it's, um, it's, it's actually very uh, representative of the, of the fund. But maybe to just add something to what he was saying, is that we are born with two forms of capital as individuals. We are born with either financial capital and also human capital. Yeah? So as we grow, our financial capital is very small. We go through school, 
we have no financial capital actually, only shamanic capital. But as you're working more so in that age group, you're converting your shamanic capital into financial capital. It means that someone has to take uh, an effort to ensure that whatever they are earning through their labor, which is basically the wages, is slowly converted into financial capital. Because at the end of the day, if the time comes for you to retire, where your now your shamanic capital is very small at retirement. Shamanic capital is actually non-existent almost because no one is hiring you in any case. You must have significant financial capital. So there must be a method over time where you convert your shamanic capital, which are you earning through either business, yeah, or work in terms of employment, like at NSF or any other company where you work. You convert the, that slowly into financial capital by saving it, investing it in the businesses that create value for you over the long term. And, you know, from something you said earlier about why you're not surprised this is the age bracket, this is when people are taking on more responsibilities and starting to think, yeah. I don't have this job forever or you know maybe the money i'm making here is not even enough to cover the family and so on um one of the things that we are often told is um that people who are young younger people and you know maybe they're interested in business they're interested in starting up something they don't have the money yeah the older people who are have the money can't take the risk yeah. and i guess that's where we come to the risk return and the age story, um, the friends of NSSF, the, the, those are your closest friends, the yeah. ones who are coming closer to 55. Yeah. It makes it seem like a sort of hopeless situation. We can't win either way. Either we are young and broke or we are old and we can't do anything with our money. Tell us about this relationship between investment and age. Okay. Thank you so much, Josephine. So it's, it's a very interesting um, uh, relationship. First of all, risk and return are uh, intertwined. They can't be separated. Um, the return usually you get depends on what risk you pursue, usually, but not that it's a must. And uh, as Mr. Mukasa mentioned, you have to be very careful because it starts with the risk. Return is a result of the risk you pursued. It's not the other way around. Unfortunately, for most people, they start by asking about the return, not the risk. So. The investment objective, we say, the objective of any investment one is making should be said in terms of risk and return. So if I want a risk, let's say, of whereby if I have a herd of cattle, I'm not willing to lose one cut every year, one piece of maybe one head of cattle every year, it means that I will have to pursue certain mechanisms perhaps to guard against that risk, yeah? And consequently, I may have a different return. But if I have perhaps another appetite for risk, as he mentioned it, I could be willing to do so many funny things and uh, pa pursue some bit of excess, excess risk. So risk and return are very intertwined. They can't be separated. Now, age, as is, is feeds into risk because age dictates how much risk you can pursue. As you mentioned rightly, is that when you're young, yeah, you can pursue a bit of uh, much more risk. Why? Because you, know, you can recover from different falls. That's, that's the point, yeah? If you're 25 and you start a company and it collapses, you can start another at 27, yeah? You can start another at 30, 31, 35. If you're 55 years and take an SF man and start a company and it collapses and you put there all your money, then you can't recover from that, that sort of fall. So the opportunity that age gives you when you're young is the ability to pursue risk. Nevertheless, there are some other enhancers, yeah? Even a 25-year-old, as you mentioned, who is broke, should not pursue so much risk as long as the income they are earning just supports their basic life needs. But if you're a 25 year old who has built some basic wealth, whether inherited or you've been careful with the way you've been a saving part of your wealth, then it augments the amount of risk you can pursue. The same way when you're 55 year old. A 55 year old man who is wealthy or lady who is very wealthy actually has a high ability to pursue risk. So basically, wealth as an aspect enhances your ability to pursue risk doesn't matter the age it's an overriding thing the second is the behavior yeah the behavioral aspect which affects your standard of living or based on your standard of living even if you're 30 years you have so you can pursue too much risk and you have billions of money but you're living an excessive lifestyle then you can't also you don't qualify to pursue too much risk yeah so there are other enhancers or things that take away your ability to take risk even if you're still young, or make you able to pursue risk even if you're old, as long as you've gotten some things right across your life. Uh, Livingston, I'm, I'm going to come to you because I, 
I'm hoping you have a story from your own journey that helps us understand even better what Ibrahim has just said. You started business at a very at a younger age, yeah. relatively young age, with no formal business education. So I guess you were picking it up as you went along the way. Um, are there any risks, any foolish risks perhaps that you took that can help us understand uh, what we are talking about? Uh, I, I think, uh, Josephine, the smart people are usually, over time, you, you see wealth by the time you are 50 or 55. You, you, the sum of all the decisions that you have made along the journey. And one of them for me was that I actually married a very risk, I'm very, uh, my risk appetite is high. Uh, given, give me a, a, a 30 to 70, I would take it. But my wife wouldn't take it 40 to 60. So, so I, I have a conservative, a conservative uh, 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 life mate. However, there is something that actually has helped me on my journey. I knew from the word go that what is important is to win the food war. When I speak about the food war, the food war is when you don't know where rent is coming, you don't know where the clothes are coming in, you don't know where the food is coming from. At that point, your risk appetite, you, you, it's not even about risk, it's about survival. So anyone that wants to walk the, 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 the wealth creation journey needs to first win the food war. And for me, that was number one. It took me five years. And when, when I got to a point where I, I know my people could be able to eat, then I could go hunting. Because when you go to hunt, let me just use back to our old days, the traditional ways. You can't go hunting for three days if there is no food for one day at home. Once you are able to settle and they have food for one day, you can tell your wife, you know what, I am going to hunt a buffalo and I'm going to be three days away from home. So that was for me. So uh, at around between, between 2000 and 2005, for me the battle was, can I win the food war? And, and so that's, that, that's how it started. Because once you get there, then you can see... Uh, areas where you can grow. So I also want to, to, to mention that over the over time and the lesson that I have learned, I want us to decoup the issue of getting wealthy, getting ready for retirement and decoup it from age. Because usually when you are smarter, when your decision making, the sum of it over time has, has added up, you could, you could get to a point where by 40 you are sorted. I saw someone, a lady at 38, who is already financially independent and only works, she doesn't run a business. So the, 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 the thing here is to know what will it take you to cut clean and say, hey, I can live one year without needing a job. I can live two years. Maybe we'll dig into that a little bit later. So issue of, of when can I recover, I have fallen down, which, which, is, which Ibrahim raised very interestingly. That when you start a business and you fail, you can, you can recover. Now, I, I don't know if I would. I, I, I actually been com commenting about cleaning services because that was the first cleaning I read, the business I ran. When I started the cleaning services, I didn't, didn't have a, a single machine when I started out. I went out and used the excess capacity in the industry and built a formidable, a formidable business out that way. Right now, I can't compete with the younger kids on the street that are building cleaning companies. I can't. So if I were to go back, I have to be very careful that I don't fall back where to are because they will have me for a meal. You, you said in, in an article that you posted on your LinkedIn a few days ago, you, you said you observed that the millionaires that have made their money the honest way tend to be older, in their late 40s or 50s. And you also said, I don't know where the belief that you can get rich quick or die trying came from, but take it from me, it will take time. Speak to me about pyramid schemes. This idea that um, there's no risk here, I'll put in money, and I'll get rich. We've been, uh, let me tell you a story. In 2016, I began to build Mazima retirement plan. And there was this lady who was a friend to me and was, uh, was just retiring out of Chambogo, or one of the universities in town. And, but this lady had some money that she was getting. And I told her, do not put the money in one coin. Because I, the, the thing about pyramid schemes is that when you look at them, they always promise you high return. They promise you, you, they are opaque in the way they make money. And then they are also opaque in where they are stationed, where you are sending money, if you start wiring money somewhere. So, so all of these were clear to me. So I told the lady, please don't invest your some 50, 60 million into one coin. You're going to lose it. 
he didn't listen to me. But that's one case. One coin as, as a scam in this market, according to the BBC, took $15 million out of our economy. So every time there is a, a pyramid scheme that succeeds in our economy, it makes the work of Ibrahim and people like me so difficult because people become suspicious. But in the first time, they are the ones that actually made the mistake. So I am here to tell you that there is no one that can guarantee they will make money. If someone guarantees you an investment, walk away. Because every time you invite to invest, as Ibrahim said, you invite, whenever you invite, you look for profit. You invite risk. So if someone says, let's invest together, we'll make money together and we'll split it this way. I also ask, how will we split the risk when it happens? When we lose money, how will we split the risk? That's a question that is not on our table. So I, I like now what I have learned when I, when I am offering investment uh, advice or products. I like to speak about the fact that you lose money more because I want people to walk away. If someone is not speaking to you how what happens when they lose the things don't work out. We have seen it with Telex. We have seen it we now we, we had this uh, BLB football. And the, the schemes keep coming. But come on, let's wake up. Let's understand that money will be made over time. Now, to speak to your question about the age of 50, which I find very interesting, is when I was about, uh, about 32, 33 years, I made a decision by myself that I would be financially independent by 50. And that's what I've been pursuing. Incidentally, I've been lucky to hit that at 46. However, I went out and looked for people that were, had retired at below 50. And the majority of the people I met, mostly outside Uganda, had been older. They, 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 are, they are older because here in Uganda, people don't normally talk about their, their, their financial net worth. It's a difficult question to find someone here. By the time someone trusts you with their numbers here, mm. they need to make sure you're not coming from the tax man. <laughs> so so I, I have looked around, and as, uh, even from my own example, I feel a bit of that, that now that I'm a, coming to 50, I am more financially secure than I was when I was 30. So just you know, get into, like I said, the sum of decisions that you're making. Who are you marrying? Please take your brain with you. Because that's important. In fact, your, your biggest financial economic decision you're going to do is the person you marry. So now from there, the kids you have, where you're taking them to school, where, where you are living, and all of those decisions that come with your consumption are all important to add up. It will take you time, but you'll get there. I Ibrahim, do you want to add to, to yeah, thank what you. Um, um, so precisely the pyramid schemes. Yes. I think the Ariwa is the promise they give. Um, the is the promise return. People never ask about the risk. It's like betting. Yeah, this is pure betting. Um, if you don't like betting, but you can invest in a pyramid, a pyramid scheme, then I don't see a difference. So if you go into a pyramid scheme, you must love betting. Because you're betting your money away. They are opaque, as he's mentioned. They are purely, you don't know, they are not regulated, first of all, locally. If you're looking for some sort of formal investment schemes, and you must ensure it's regulated by the CMA, at least locally. Not one that exists online, and you don't know about it. So this is a promise of wealth, first wealth, and yet, as we've mentioned, wealth is built over time. No one really gets wealthy overnight. So if someone comes to you with something that looks too good to be true, then you should walk away. Guarantees as well. Anything that makes guarantees and in investments is not allowed, actually. It's unethical to invest in something that has made a guarantee, as long as it has risk behind it. If someone is making a guarantee to you, ask them, where is the insurance policy that makes you make this guarantee? So, if you look at it in that sense, that the, re the pyramid schemes just looking at risk, I'm sorry, return and not risk, and they make guarantees which should not be made, but the allure for quick wealth is, is what makes people go there and desperation. But they should always know that wealth is built over time, it is earned, it's a process, and it's out of accumulatively many small decisions over time that make you wealthy. You know, every time, every time we talk about, I'm coming to Livingston, when we talk about pyramid schemes and we're told you need to, you know, do your research, what do you mean do my research? Where am I going to check up? I'm just going to go to Google and type that in and say, does this thing exist? What does that look like? How do I know what regulation in that area looks like? So it, it, it came to you through some, in one way or the other. Typically in this market, my experience is there are always samples selling it. It's network marketing. Uh, Josephine invests. 
tells Ibra about it. Ibra tells Mr. Mukasa about it, and it goes on like that. It's network marketing. So you start by asking those very questions from those very people and go beyond that network that you know. That's, that's the easiest thing that one could do. Because normally it, it hurts a network of people. Yeah, it's basically, I know some people, friends of mine, who are working like in one single bank. These are bankers, and they were hurt by uh, this uh, one coin thing. So it's a network, normally a very small circle, that it's a, but go beyond that network and ask questions. Ask the experts. They will give you very independent advice. You may not like it, but ask them. Also, you could go to people like CMA, to be honest with you. They are always open to, to receive anyone. Ask them about these schemes, but ask the easiest is to ask for beyond the network where the whole story is coming from. All right, thanks. Yeah. Livingston? Uh, the scheme, the people that build scams all over the world now, no one for a title ground. It's Uganda. Everyone that is building a, a pyramid scam somewhere, or scheme for that matter, ends up trying to test it in Uganda because they know they will make money. I will become, I will become Guribo. Perhaps we need to be to wake up to, to the reality. But I want to speak to something that we might confuse. And, and it, it came from one of the bankers in town. I went to meet him, and he was retiring. And he said something that, that, that has stuck with me all these years. And he said, business is gambling, but gambling is not a business. And so, so you could potentially, every time we take a bet, and my, my friend here, uh, Mr. Ibrahim, has spoken about taking betting. You, you can bet on something, but do you have the education, the research that you have mentioned about, that makes you that you're likely to be a winner? Do you have your numbers? Have you crunched your, 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 your have you done your homework? Luck. That, yes. So luck is also important, but luck <laughs> it cannot be strategy. That's for sure. <laughs> luck cannot be a strategy. So when you look at, one of the things that I've developed and I need to address today is the issue that people are now aware that they are pyramid schemes. But whenever you are the first one, you can make money. So they actually rush in, hoping that they will be the first one. Mm. And they will make money. They, will, they, they, they got burnt. I know somebody that recently got burnt in this BLB thing. 15 million, do, 15 million Uganda shillings. Because he thought he would be first before it expires. So sometimes people are entering the, the scams, actually knowing that they, they are scams, but they hope that they be the, 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 the beneficiary. So the rule of, of a capitalist, and I speak as one, when you own a capital, you become a capitalist. The rule of a capitalist never lose your money. And the second rule is never lose your money. And it's even worse when you manage other people's money. In this town, whether you, whether you have lost the money genuinely or not, once you lose money on an investment, they will run you out of town. That's the nature of our, of our street here. So, so as, as you go out to invest, the first rule is never lose your money. So, in other words, what are the chances that if I lose, now, I, now that I am in my late 40s, I like to quantify my loss. And I ask myself, if I invest here 50 million and it doesn't go well, how much am I likely to lose? If it's all of it gone, I will not put it in there. But remember, I'm a risk taker, I'm a born risk taker. But over time, experience helps you to pick out some of these uh, areas where you can invest. Let him who has ears. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> sure? on that area of uh, pyramid schemes, um, let's speak, we're still speaking about risk. How do you develop risk tolerance? Ibrahim, I'm going to start with you. So, um, thank you so much, Josephine. So, risk tolerance um, is behavioral. Yeah. Um, there, is, there are two things about risk. There's a bit of take risk and then risk tolerance. Ability comes from um, many things that we can see, yeah. Like as I mentioned earlier, your age. Uh, younger as a younger guy, uh, other th factors constant. You have a high ability to take risk. If you're wealthy, you're a rich person. Uh, perhaps wealth is from many forms. You built it. Um, you've inherited it, um, which in uh, in our culture tends to be not seen as a source of wealth, but you've inherited it. Um, you have actually. Um, you basically you're wealthy that gives you a higher take risk but tolerance is more of um, the behavioral traits within you you find it that um, the gender for instance the male have a high tolerance doesn't mean that they have a higher ability to take risk but they have a high tolerance as, as as even toddlers they tend to take more risk than the than the ladies consequently if you see it as well uh, the the ladies actually tend to do better with their man over time than than the gents yeah the tolerance is small, but moderated. 
so um, tolerance is more of behavioral, and this behavior comes from experiences. Yeah, it's shaped largely by experiences. Def yeah. When you speak about the ladies, is it that we are more risk averse? You are more prudent, I, I would say. I would, okay. I would suppose prudent yes, they are more prudent word. with the way they will ask the num the questions that he was he was saying. <laughs> His wife. <laughs> yes, they will ask the but, questions. But, but, but Ibrahim, yes. just to make sure that I, I also find that ladies consult a lot. They also work in some kind of uh, a circle. Mm. Yes. That's why when they lose, they all lose. <laughs> but if he's in a safe circle. He's likely to be. Yeah, but it allows us questions, <laughs> as you've just said, in terms of consulting. What's my return? Yeah. Mm. How often will I get my money? How will it be coming? They ask the questions that are a bit uncomfortable. Yet for the gentleman, tell him about the return and he will commit the money before even hearing about the what? The risks about the return. Yeah. That's why most of these schemes, as we said earlier, have the gents in there. But again, ladies are being found in those circles as, as part of the network. So tolerance is more shaped by behavior and experiences. The first thing is that you need to take, take some risk and see how it works out. Once it burns you, there are two, three things about it. Either you will pursue more or you will walk away. Okay. So the issue of tolerance is, 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 is always married with, with what you've experienced in life, is what, but also desires as well as we see. Because if you have now met your basic needs in life, then you can tolerate taking risk as he was mentioning. If you, now you can afford to basically uh, put the food on the table, you can afford to pay rent, perhaps all these basic needs of life, you can now tolerate a bit of risk. And that grows over time as you, you continuously achieve more aspirations. That is where it all comes from. So yeah. That's why the tolerance is more of experience, behavioral, and all these basic needs being put in place. Right. Yeah. Livingston, I know you want to, to comment on, on um, what Ibrahim has been speaking about, but as you do, you had also started to speak about risk appetite. So I want you to also respond to how do I know my risk appetite and why is it important for me to know my risk appetite? Wow. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Ibrahim here will also know that the work we've been doing under in, in the, the financial literacy space, including me, because we've been doing this for nearly 10 years in this space. Our people have become educated. And as they become financially literate, products like unit trusts that had lagged on the market for so long have picked up. We nearly now have 1.9 trillion that is managed under unit trusts. Now, so, so this work that we are doing, like what we are doing today, is not actually in vain. People are listening and they're beginning to ask the tough questions which is good. So the first thing you need to do in order to improve your, your, your risk tolerance is educate yourself. Educate yourself on the products on the market, educate yourself on the, the economic environment, educate yourself on the cycles and the ways of money and what influences. Because money is a derivative of the value we create in the marketplace. So then, what also you need to look at is that over time, we become specialists. We specialize. When you are young, when I, I just came out of college and I, I, had, uh, I had studied marketing, I knew gen I was a generalist. A generalist, but it took me a bit of time. I found I understood the service industry and I stood particularly cleaning and the cleaning processes. So it's, no, it's, it's, not, it's, it's, not, it's not difficult to see why I ended up with a, quite a very, very, a, a very large footprint in the area. So specialization is important. But I also want to talk about risk tolerance is... I, I spoke about someone you marry, but I want to go back to someone that said that one hustler can lose, but it's hard for two hustlers to lose. So if, if I, I know, in my case, there have been cases where I go, to, I go to invest, but I know we are not going to learn out of food because my wife can put food on the table. And for that, I, I am grateful. If I am that guy, I can go to northern Uganda and spend a week knowing if I, I come empty-handed, madam will take care of that. Perhaps when you are two hustlers, you can have a better, a better risk appetite. And of course, we have talked about age. But uh, hold on. Before you go further, there's a question for you from uh, one of our audience members on that marriage issue. And the question is, how about those who married long ago? Do you want them to change? <laughs> I, interestingly, I said, uh, no, please, do, do not. But we can always educate, educate your member. Uh, have a session about money. The, the two of you, come and see someone like me. Or come and we talk. There might be something to unlock. Because usually, this is me. Now, the, you might not see the empirical evidence. But I have found that couples where one has an office job and another one is a hustler in the market, those, those are making good progress. 
because they have hedged themselves out into the equation. One has in the market and the other one has a safe, a safe job. Now it could be either the husband or the wife, it could be. It doesn't necessarily, the sex doesn't need to matter. But that's what I have found in, and maybe that can speak to her. And uh, so I, I need to shoot into the question of risk appetite. Yes. Now they are primarily, and my, perhaps my, my friend here, Ibrahim, could, could say more about that. They are from primarily three, low, medium, high. So every time an, an investment comes to you, you also fall into that. There are people that are low risk takers. Doesn't mean they will not make money. It might take them longer to build a compounding ability for their money, but they will get there. They just when you have low risk appetite, what you simply do is give yourself time. And no, I'll be rich at fifty, I'll be rich at sixty. But you get where you're going. If you are medium, medium is usually entrepreneurs, but they also invest in areas they understand pretty well. So they won't invest in an area where they have not worked in. So a case in point would be Ibrahim starting an, a fund management fund. That would be medium. Now, if, I, if it's me, it will be high risk. Because I'm going into an area I don't understand or I don't have very good granular, granular look into it. But, so if you go in medium, high risk is where you start now. The, 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 the high risk is usually you have less knowledge. You are uh, undercapitalized in the area. You are not poorly, you are poorly connected. If you add all of those together, knowledge, connection, and, and, and then the capital base that you are using, you should be working in the high risk area. So what could be high risk for you could actually be medium for me. So you, doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean, it means what I have taken myself. Now, I have t decided to school myself in the things of money. So things that are easier for me to do, like we recently took on a project where I started with no money and we have been able to raise 1.5 million, 1.5 billion to build homes for sale. When you look at it from Ibrahim's side, it could be that it's risky. However, I was coming in from an area where I had built an audience. I had people that could trust me and I could be, I could people that could say, okay, Livingstone, we know him. He's a known quantity. So now that's how you build your risk, uh, risk appetite. And, 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 but remember, the key number is whenever you invest somewhere and you can't sleep well at night, you've made a bad decision, no matter where you have invested. Ibrahim, I'm bringing that same question to you. How do I know my risk appetite and why is it important <coughs> for me to know that so that I don't stay awake the whole night? Okay, so the first thing is that um, the, you have goals, you set goals, and the investments are journey to those goals. Now, there are those goals you don't want to miss, yeah, there are those goals which I'm comfortable missing. I would say, for instance, you don't want not to be able to pay your kids' fees or tuition, whatever it has to be. You don't want not to have a decent retirement, but perhaps you could miss a holiday, for instance. Now, so the easiest way at a human level or at an individual level is what we call a goal-based thinking. And that's how you also think about your risk. We say that you apportion your money in a basket. It's acceptable. It's not the optimal way, but it's the, it's the easiest way to relate with your money. So you position your money into different baskets, and each of those baskets corresponds to different levels of risk or appetite for risk. The baskets that you can't miss, you cannot subject the instruments or the investments in that basket to high risk at all. Now, these aspirational baskets where you say, okay, I wish when I am uh, 55 years or 75 years, I want to go to the Bahamas. You could pursue that aggressively. Yeah, It means that, it means that for those, you could miss and doesn't hurt you. So that's the way you look at money as well. If you have, if the reason why you're putting down this money is for things that you can't miss, then you can't play with it. You can't pursue excessive risk with it. Now, if you could perhaps associate, you could, you could actually lose part of that money, then you could basically pursue the high risk. So I find it strange sometimes when I find someone is telling me that they want to pay their kids' fees in five years, and then they are buying instruments that don't actually match or that are very risky. So the investment that you make is a solution to your problem, yeah? is a solution to your goal. It is what actually will enable you to achieve your goal. If you actually think that the results of, of the result is the investment, that the investment itself will be enough to ensure that you achieve that goal, it's not good enough. You must let the tool very well. How are you willing to, what would happen if you didn't achieve your goal against what would happen if you achieved it? For those you can't miss, make sure the risk is low and you have a lower rate for risk.
in simple. That's the simplest way you could look at it. But it's also right by saying that there are three levels of risk, low, medium, and high. And actually, the beauty is there are investments or instruments that follow through all those different categories yeah, in the marketplace. So consequently, depending on what you're pursuing, if you speak to an expert, if you speak to practitioners, they'll tell you. Anything to do with, for instance, business, if you've never done business. For a businessman who does business, investing in more business is not risky. For someone who has never done a business, going into a new business that you don't understand at all, you're pursuing high risk. But there are the basics like buying bonds. Interestingly, in Uganda, bonds are very low risk in actual sense because your government guarantees you, generally, we will say that, guarantees that will always pay you your, your coupon and whatever it is that it commits to pay you. But they offer a decent return. Yeah? It's, it's a bit vice versa. And then the stock market, for instance, which is very risky and that's doesn't, hasn't done well over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's that understanding of the several intricacies. They're not constant. That whatever works well may be in a market in a book that you read about works well here. You must let with the instruments in the market in which you are. Yeah, in actual sense. Thank you. Livingston, when I see you take notes, I know you want to say something. So before I go to the next question, please express yourself. What I see very common uh, is the, the question about trying to earn more with less. Like someone sent me a question, literally, I have 25,000, how can I invest? 25,000 25, shillings? Yes, okay. how can I invest? Literally, you can't even buy a meal in this town with 25,000. However, I have a word for that person. And so, when you have less, what you have as an advantage is your time and the ability to use that money at a quick at a quick turn around, which we call very store of money. So that's the first point that I need. So when you have less, don't invest things that we sit. Don't buy treasury bills with 25,000 or 500,000. Because what can work for you is to buy a sack of, of matoke and turn out in three to four days you have sold it, made some money. That's what I call very store of money. So that's how you're going to, uh, to make a bit of advantage. And then the other one is, I would tell people, frankly speaking, it's okay to lose money. If the market do, does, doesn't have warriors, sometimes the market fools everybody. The market can make a fool of anybody. So when you lose money and you have lost it genuinely, you thought things would work out, it has happened to me. I invested some 40 million in northern Uganda into an agriculture project and I lost the money. I went home and I told my wife I have lost 40 million. She did not slap me, but I had lost the money. So when you lose the money, please don't lose the lesson. What lesson mm. did I learn? From that, in, from that failure in northern Uganda. It was that the farmers in Uganda primarily they don't respect contracts. When, yeah, when you, 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 you contract a farmer to grow for you maize and it will, you buy it at 1,000 shillings. If the market opens at 800, the farmer wants 1,000 shillings. But if the market opens at 1,200 shillings, the farmer sells to somebody else, no matter what you had invested. So do not lose the lesson. And the last point I want to emphasize on, on, on this journey is uh, 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 it is the question of uh, affordability versus utility, which which is something that also becomes uh, becomes uh, becomes quite important in, in this journey of investing. Is that and until you know what is it that can work for you, because what works for you cannot sometimes cannot work for me. So you need to know. I have now known what the thing that I need to work on. I have whittled out things that make me not sleep well at night, and I'm, I'm becoming wiser with my time to know what, what what is it that I need to work on and what I didn't. I don't need to work on. Is Thank there you. a buffer for some of these risks? You know, so you're 40 million in northern Uganda, and with the understanding now that farmers in Uganda don't respect contracts, is there is there some kind of shock system that can support the next investor? in an area like that, with no. that knowledge? So, so, uh, Josephine, beautiful question. I think what we need to do in Uganda, and which I have seen happen in America, because in America they love what we call comeback kids. People that have failed, but when they come back, they come back stronger, because they have learned the lessons. In Uganda, when you, when you fail, you become a paria. People don't like you. But what the point I'm raising is that people that fail, we need to share the stories of failure, and accept that the market can fall, 
anybody. So allow our people to fail and allow them to try again. If you are, you are raising money in America and you tell them, I have failed two times, you are likely to get funded than the guy who has never failed. So, and, and, so, and, and the, we could even say that failure could be, if you, you start a, if you get out of campus and you build a business and you fail, you are better off than someone who went and got an MBA out of the experience of, of managing that process of failure. So we need to allow our people know that it's okay to fail, but don't lose the lesson. Okay. Um, Ibrahim, earlier on when you were speaking about um, risk, was it risk appetite? Yes. I wanted to ask you, quickly run me through low risk, medium risk, high risk with examples um, so that myself and the audience members can start to think about the advantages, the disadvantages, and where we want to place ourselves. Okay. So um, before I do that, I'll just emphasize what he said, that in markets like the U.S., the risk, risk scoring models will give you a higher score if actually you've lost money because of something I said at the beginning. Experience. Yeah. Remember, I emphasized that uh, risk tolerance is also about experience. So that will be um, a key aspect. If you go in a bank in the U.S. to borrow money and you've ever lost money, then the person who has never lost money, you're likely to be given a higher, lo bigger loan than someone who has never lost money because of the experience. And it's about the assumption here is that you've learned from the experience. Because unfortunately, we don't do learn from experiences. We don't keep records. We entrust others with most of our investments. Yeah. There are two types of investments generally. It will either be passive or active. Passive is like me planting trees where I come from in Mayuge, and then they've gone to a particular stage and I leave them there. It doesn't matter. They could grow. But if I went to Mayuge and did um, a coffee, a coffee sort of uh, plantation, every time they're harvesting, I have to ensure I'm there. So the, the, these experiences could be different. If it was active and you weren't there, you know nothing about what was happening actually, so you didn't learn enough. But if one um, takes an effort to learn from their story, they can always get better and better. And consequently, over time, you're able to create wealth. In terms of risk, the three levels of low risk. Low risk is someone actually who doesn't want to lose their money at all. Yeah, That is their obsession. They will say, I am giving you my money, Yeah, but do not lose my money at all. They, are, they prefer safety. Like yeah. you'd rather not bring back a profit, just bring back my money. At worst, at extreme. Bring back my money. That's what you have to do. That's a low risk person. So uh, this is typical. Again, uh, this is research. Yeah, the ladies will say that at least to you. At worst, bring back my my money as 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 to win. That's a low risk person. It's 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 not a good way to develop wealth. Yeah, because as he mentioned, you must be able to take on some risk and accept some losses. It's it is in terms of age that is expected of a retiree. Yeah. Uh, retiree if you're retired and you don't have enough wealth and uh, perhaps you're investing into something at minimum let it guarantee you returning your money but if you're a very wealth retiree who can pursue risk then you can do other things so very low risk low appetite for risk and low return consequently most likely now the second one is medium medium they will tell you that you may lose something possibly but very small as well maybe up to five percent or if you lose this, stop there and bring back my what? My money. That's the middle, the middle case. They will tolerate some risk, but not very high risk. They will only invest in things that they understand, probably. They will want to pursue things that they typically understand. Yeah. For instance, I will be someone, I work in a bank, and I, fixed, I invest in a fixed deposit in a bank. In simple terms, let me use that for example, yeah? Or I basically work in, uh, let's say, um, in, uh, in, in, let's say, school, and I have understood the business of a school, and I invest only in a school. Basically, you want to let with things that you understand. You don't want to go out of that circle in things that you don't understand. It's more of a controlling kind of thing. You want to control the outcome in, 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 in some sense. High risk, these are people who will put their money where they think the return is the highest. Yeah, Typical of young males. Yeah, very, very young males. Pyramid schemes. Yeah, so this <laughs> typical very young males. They will think that they can control the outcome. Yeah, and that's a very, very um, subtle thing. Because when you're investing money, 
Ideally, most times you can't control the outcome, but these people will believe that they can control the outcome. That if I put money right now in, let's say, in a stock, let's say Stambic, it will give me 17%, and in one way or the other way, it will return 17%. So these will pursue usually very high risk. But again, it's, it's, it's not that it's a bad thing to pursue high risk. It depends on what state in life you're in. If you have something to turn to once these things go bad, then pursue the risk, because once one goes off right, yeah, one of them gets right, you may do very well. It, it could be a good thing. But again, it's a wholesome thing. You have to look at the all, all what surrounds you. What do I have? What would I turn to? What if it goes wrong? What happens? Buffers, as you mentioned earlier. Thank right. you. Livingstone is high risk because his spouse can take, is his buffer. <laughs> <laughs> Livingstone, I know you want to comment on that. And, and as you comment on uh, high risk, medium risk, and um, low risk, I also want you to answer this question for me is there a point at which risk can be totally avoided um, uh, the person there is a person who avoided risk by not getting out of bed and crossing <laughs> the lawn <laughs> and it is a ceiling <laughs> that fell on him <laughs> and killed him so as, as as long as you are alive as long as you're a living being we take risks every single day We've taken a risk to come into this building to do this interview because we think the engineer did a good work. So risk cannot be avoided. It's part of life. However, I need to, to, to say something about risk management because it's related to, to the way we see risk. When you are young, we said, you start by building a portfolio aggressively. And if you're aggressive, you, you have a bit of maybe, in my case, I have a bit of, of factories and I have a bit of uh, service industries. But it gets to a point where you now, every 10 years, a good portfolio should be rebalanced. When, when I say rebalanced, it means that now it needs to reflect who you are. Because if you don't do that, you end up with a situation, especially for our retired, there are a lot of people that are on this particular webinar today that are retired. And they are facing something we call cash flow poverty. Where it's a situation where you are rich. Essentially, you have assets, you have land, you have buildings, but you don't have cash. So you actually have an asset portfolio, you are not poor, but when you, they take you to the hospital right now, you can't pay a bill of 2 million shillings. Because your portfolio is not balanced, only balanced, to fit the age bracket that you are in. So now, as you start to grow, uh, you need to be able to look into, does the portfolio that I currently own... Now, you see, in this market, we tend to look at the people without money. And those are the people we see in the newspapers. But I've primarily started seeing people in, in this market speaking to people that actually have money and need to hear the things that we are saying. People that are taking the 200 billion, that took 200 billion from NSSF this, uh, this particular month. You need to rebalance. You've taken money out. What you have done by taking money from NSSF, you have removed money from your capital account. That was money that was making you 10% every, every month. You've taken it out. It won't make the 10%. Now you need to be able to rebalance it and make sure that you're not losing the return that you are getting out of NSSF. A critical point to note is that it's bad business, it's bad practice to always turn to your capital to co-fund consumption. Because that's a problem. You take money out of NSSF and you buy a car. That's consumption. You need to make sure that when you are rebalancing, you are rebalancing for the effect that cash flow is important. And so, so that rebalancing phase is actually very critical to avoid a situation of where uh, cash flow poverty comes into the equation. I'll tell you, I think our people remember stories, and let me end with this story. I had a friend that owned assets worth 600 million. And this person was taken to Mulago Hospital with a liver problem that could be treatable. But he couldn't raise the 5 million in the short at, at, at the age of 62, he couldn't raise 5 million for his treatment. And unfortunately, the guy died. Every time I speak about cash flow poverty, I remember the 600 million, he was my client, but he couldn't be able to get out 5 million to be treated. That's not happened to someone here. I, I, I really want to ask where his close-knit friends, his human capital, what do they call it? <laughs> yes, where, where are they? I, they couldn't five come. million shillings? He couldn't. It, 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 and they, he has assets, what, 600 million six, shillings? And this about maybe eight, seven years ago. He didn't, couldn't raise five million. And so unfortunately we lost him. Okay. Yeah, um, perhaps I could just add to that, yeah, to emphasize that this, your risk profile changes every day. 
or over time. Uh, the simplest is um, if let's say you've been a young male and you don't have a family and you get a family, the risk profile has changed, yeah? Because if a child comes in place, it has some implications. There will be the amount of needs in the house will change. So your risk profile changes. As you migrate into uh, and, and retire, risk profile changes. So earlier in the life, um, earlier in the life when you, when, you, when you didn't have all these responsibilities, perhaps you would take risk, which we call things that tend to grow much in value without generating cash. For instance, land, raw land, yeah, uh, raw land. If someone buys raw land, you can't buy raw land hoping to sell it in two months, yeah. But, but I've seen people do that it's because raw land, in actual sense, you're going to, not going to give you cash. But if you have a goal to meet maybe in ten years, then raw land would, for instance, make sense. Then, as you age and near retirement, you need cash, yeah, to emphasize what he was saying. So you want to slowly move into assets that now generate cash, for instance, bonds, for instance, uh, um, rent, uh, commercial or rental real estate of, of some sort of sense. So risk profile is not a constant, yeah? Circumstances change in your life that also change the risk that you can pursue. All right. Yeah. I think you're both excellent teachers. I've understood yeah. things that I'd struggled with for a while. Um, my final question before we get to questions from the audience, and some of them you might have answered, but I'll still read them out. It's important for our audience to know we've seen what they've sent us. How much do you need to be ready for retirement? And should you retire at 55 or at 60? Uh, I'll go first because it's something that I have I've started in depth especially uh, in my book, The Great Financial Rebuild, I've looked at the question of adequacy, of, especially in a country like Uganda. How much do I need to have for me to say I am ready for retirement? And so it bleeds to two things. The first one is the number. There is a constant that I have developed. And the, the constant is 150, 150. Just get whatever your living expenses and multiply them with 150. So if you live on 2 million shillings, might apply it with 150. It will give you 300 million. So the adequacy is 300 million. Keep whatever your income level, this would work for you. And just to prove my numbers, because we make these assumptions over and over again, and you want to find out if they are true, take 300 million, give them to my, to my colleague, my fellow panelist here, Ibrahim. He will invest it for you, and that, uh, that 300 million... Uh, of 2 million that you're debating on, it will give you an average of 3 million every month because it's getting 10% from his inv investment portfolio. So that's where the adequacy is. So once you note the adequacy, the key question then becomes, how far am I on the journey? If you are 35 or 40, uh, when you are 35, it's okay. You might be struggling. But if you are 45 today and you are still 50% away from hitting that target, then there is a problem because you are, you are not going to get to adequacy. But it raises a very important question which I have seen in this market, misrepresented actually for that matter. The question is that the money I have at NSSF is enough for me to retire on. Usually it's not because you are saving just 15% of your money. And when you save 15% of your money, and your lifestyle keeps increasing and your living expenses, you actually short by 5% over time. You'll be short over time 5%. And because of compounding interest, this 5% will compound into large sums of money. So if you only want to rely on the money at NSSF, it's not going to be enough. And which then poses a key question for our discussion today. What are you doing with the 95% that is remaining with you? That is a key question because if you don't... Bet a bit of use a bit of that. What you have at NSSF is not enough. Now the, the, the data is there that uh, the people that withdraw the money, the one, the two, the, those that took the two hundred million from the fund this this month, three years later they will be broke. Now they will be broke because maybe some of them mismanage the money, but primarily because they never saved enough. All right. Um, thank you, Josephine. Should I retire at fifty-five? Uh, I don't think it's a must that people should retire at 55. Life expectancy is increasing in Uganda, and um, increasingly people are living longer. So retirement doesn't mean go and rest as well. You could retire into your own businesses or into your own ideas, and that's the beauty. If you leave a formal job, you could move into your own sort of, of, sort of thing. But that thing must be built now. It can't be built then.
the biggest problem is the thing that has to be built then so retirement idea doesn't mean to go home and sit but you may leave your formal desk and then move into other things that you could do that create value for you and um, and, and your family in that sense now how much money should i have at retirement uh, he just puts down in a simple way it's about a, it's a function of your living expenses and life expectancy in a simple sense at a technical level if you're living a very high life today perhaps and you're not saving enough then retirement will humble you yeah and it will be very short it will be very short it will humble you and most likely you won't live for long to, to, to see your grand, grand grandkids and great grandkids so look at your living expenses what aspirations you have in retirement yeah um, there is a picture I saw on social media, I think a couple of weeks ago, I don't know whether it's true or not true, where the former vice president was at a beach with his, uh, ah. with his, his wife. Yes. How many people don't aspire to have that? Now, if you aspire to have that, not just at Lake Victoria in Entebbe, but somewhere different from here, then your living expenses perhaps will be high, and you must save significantly to achieve that. You will have to save beyond the necessary. You will have to save um, into more not just large amounts of money, but also into things that you're passionate about that could grow and make you happy in retirement. Because retirement is supposed to be happiness. We should not just look at the money alone, yeah? But what things in retirement will make you happy? Yeah, it's family. How will you relate with your family? Are you investing enough in them now to make you happy in retirement? These are very, very important things. So consequently, it's about the lifestyle you want to live in retirement. That's what will shape how much you need to put down before you retire. Uh, Josephine, I, I want to drop in uh, yes. by, with your permission uh, and say, I think we, the, we need to introduce the concept of early retirement <coughs> because I have seen a high correlation between people that pursue financial independence and proper getting uh, and, and good retirement planning. If people, you can retire at 40, who says you should work until you are 50? My goal was 50, to retire, to have enough money by 50. It has helped me recalibrate how I function and how I invest to make sure that I can do it at 46. So early retirement should be a concept for those that are still younger. Livingston, uh, please just add to that early retirement, um, to your support of early retirement. We've seen people who retire early and go to their grave early because of they don't have a sense of purpose, they don't have anything to wake up to, they get depressed. So I know you are continuing, I just want you to... So, so, okay, yeah. uh, let me dig in there. What the whole definition of wealth is choice. When you, you go to a supermarket in Uganda and you buy, you want to buy, let's say, bread, you probably have three choices. There is brown bread, there is salt bread, there is sweet bread, and you're gone. Try to do the same in Luxembourg or in the UK. And there will be, there will be whole wheat, there will be, there, there will be, uh, th 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 I, I can't go on, but the choice you'll be amazed with. So what happens with wealth is creation of choice. What I have found that when you are financially prepared lady for retirement, you actually have a lot of choice. Where I am now, I can choose to become a pastor, become a politician, <laughs> or go, go into academia uh, and become, become a professor. I have choice. That's what I have found. So for me, it's not a case that I'm putting up my feet and not waking up in the morning to do something. No, it's, that's not the way I define retirement. In fact, I call it recreational employment. It's now what you start working for what you work hard, but you do what you love. Yes. It's not necessarily for the money. Now, I need to, to point out that a big people, our people here are, are faith-based. Like, they are Christians, they are Muslims, they, there is a God they pray to. And every morning, you go to, to the, you pray that God gives you long life. And you even ask him, I was doing a class yesterday for one of our financial literacy classes, and someone says he want to live to be 200 years. I said, no problem. Maybe God is listening to you, he'll make you to live 200 years. But are you planning to live for 200 years? Is the way you're handling your money and your investment decisions and your working, does it show that you want to live for 200 years for this particular person? Problem is people are praying to live longer and not planning to live longer. The case is confusion in heaven, wherever your heaven is, but there is confusion. How can you be praying for something you're not preparing for? They're having children who will take care of them in their old age. Ah. We're going to take some <laughs> questions from the audience. So I'm going to read them as is and I'll read about, I'll read two, then you choose who is responding to what. So the first question, 
I'm 30 years old and a salary earner. Would you recommend the best investment vehicle? That's one question. The second question, can you share with us any business ideas per age category? What business, for example, should a 50-year-old invest in? All right, so I'll take the first one. Um, should we prescribe an investment vehicle for a 30-year-old is Sally Anna? That would be suicidal, yeah, because there is more that goes into um, making that decision. And that's the thing we were talking about earlier. Is, um, MTN is listing shares. How much should I buy? Do I make sense? It's a process that has to be thought through. It involves um, understanding in detail about the circumstances surrounding this person. Do they have a family? Yeah. What other sources of income do they have other than salary? Not so. What are their goals in life? It is. It's broad. It's not just you waking up and say, "I got a million shillings." Uh, how does it work if I put in in Safari or more in some sort of uh, stomach bank shares or into a bond? Oh, should I buy land in uh, in, uh, in 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 Mayuge or somewhere somewhere somewhere? It's more about. It, it involves you understanding yourself or having someone to understand you. And they work through the journey with you. It's a process itself. Where do you point this person to get this answer or to get a sense of themselves? The program, right, which is here uh, at the NSF, I'm sure if they are in the private sector, they work for the NSF, they could come to the NSF. There are many uh, advisors in town. Most of the brokers that are listed on, uh, like, on the CMA and USE, Grand Series Exchange, would advise. Typically, banks, yeah, a few banks who would have some who provide some guidance, um, not necessarily experts, but they could provide some guidance. Or could be friends, the circle of friends you can ask around. Um, um, in my circle, for instance, the CFA charter holders who are in this country are required to promote investments. So they, they, they can ask all through these circles, but the network of friends could be good, it could be a starting point. I'm just going to point out that your circle would be yeah. very different from other people. Your circle is probably finance people, other finance people, friends of finance and financiers yeah. like that. Yeah. So, yeah, but you can find advice from there. Okay. If you tried, yeah. Livingstone, are you taking the second one? Yeah, I I, I can add uh, on the issue of um, which business should I choose. Now we've distilled uh, me and my team as uh, we've been doing business training, supporting micro entrepreneurs in many countries, not just in Uganda. And we have probably covered like 30,000 of them in the last 10 years. And, but the key to remember whenever you're thinking of a business idea is that the question, it will not come back from, it will, the idea will not come from me. It needs to come from you. That's number one. Because what I have found, people are so desperate to get who to blame when things don't work out. <laughs> and man, if I were to, to keep telling people what to do, they will, learn, they will learn me out of this town. But these are the things to remember. If you are choosing a business, there are four things you need to always look, point to that will help you decide. The first one is capital, how much capital you have to deploy, and for how, how, how long, what time frame do you have for that capital. The skill set, what competences do you have as, as a person? What, what do people know you for? What do you do well? What do you believe in? So that's you, the skill set. And then this, the question is timing. The time you have to be able to wait until the eggs hatch, but also the timing in the market. Because there are some places, for example, I, I was coming today again with my wife in the car, uh, and, and I looked at the guy selling masks and I said, oh, this train has borrowed it. This guy doesn't know. <laughs> the train for masks has borrowed it. It's out of town. So selling masks is not going to feed your family now. So the timing and the time you have in the market. And lastly, the market also responds. The market speaks by voting with their money. If you are offering something they are not buying, first of all, make, do some research to make sure they will vote you to stay in business. And so those four areas are always critical. If you have an idea, learn it through, through those, four, uh, those four lenses, and it will point you to a place where you can look. Yeah, yeah. I think I could just add something there uh, on his list of four, is that also passion. It should not be underestimated. Although passion without ability is misplaced passion. But um, passion is very important because um, you must do something that you love at the end of the day. As long as it has a market and you have the ability to do it, you will stick to it even if it fails, typically. But passion backed with ability because most people are passionate about things sometimes that they're not capable of doing. So I may, for instance, be that I like, for instance, for me, if I liked music, I would be in the wrong place because I can't do it. Do I make sense? So. That would be misplaced passion if I bought my machines um, and hired my producers and everything, but it's not going to sell. 
that is the wrong thing. But passion is, helps you to fight through, helps you to learn, helps you to see the intricacies that, that could, not be, um, could not be discerned with ease. So it's one thing that whoever wants to pursue business should always look at as well. Not just doing things that give you money, but things that you love as well and have the skill to do or abilities to do. It, it carries you through resilience. But I don't know if it's just me that keeps getting this story about keep your passion for your retirement. Right now you need to make money. Yeah, that's why I said it's, it can't be misplaced passion. It must be something that the market appreciates as well. Uh, for instance, um, let's say you love art and you're in Uganda and you come up with all these beautiful art pieces and keep on the road. It's less likely that you'll easily make money. But if you take them, for instance, may, let's say you're on the road and you're maybe, let's say, in a, uh, Katu as an example, yeah, you may not make money. But if you have a network of, let's say, wealth people who love art, then perhaps you could make money through your art pieces. So the passion must be backed by the market. That's the idea. Your passion is, you must find a way. There are two ways. Either you create the market or the market comes to you. Creating the market is very difficult usually. You must be a very, very, very special person. Yeah? Companies like Apple have created the market for themselves. But once the market is there sometimes, then you can, your passion can easily descend through. Sometimes you can create the market. It's not an easy thing, but it's very much possible as well. All right. Um, Livingstone, I wanted to ask you this question and I forgot earlier. Um, you said at some point, one of the things that the, ex, not excuses, but the, what people usually say when we speak about business and so on is, ah, the economy, ah, the politics of the day, this, you know, they destabilize the economy. So it's sort of like the excuse for not taking risks. To quote you, you said this country has 50 million people who can't be shipped anywhere. And that's an opportunity. Where is the caution in that opportunity? Uh, so let me be very clear, because I, I also, we, we like to speak on the easy stuff. And uh, we have two types of poverty in this, in this space, but I'll get to your question. The, the structure one, where the potholes are not making it easy for you to do your deliveries. And uh, so basically, and the dependency levels, where digitally the state has to, to chip in. There is a part of that. But on a personal level, and you look, you wake up every day and you prophesy something. There is some things you say to yourself. So if you keep giving excuses, there is no perfect time to start a business. There is no. You, if you wait for a perfect time to start a business, there will be none. So, so the reality is that you are born in Uganda, this is the place you have. And if you don't have papers and you don't have uh, a place um, to go and get a good job like I was, I wasn't lucky to get a good job. This is the, the market we have. But 50 million people are eating salt every day. Have you ever gone to the, good, the, the, the salt good ahead, the, the, the warehouse that sells salt in our market here on, on, on near the Kampala City Council Central Division? There is a big warehouse where people store salt, uh, the warehouse for salt. So this market is buying goods every day. My question is, what can I provide in this, to these 50 million people? Maybe they are not 50 million that I see. But in the area where I live, there are 2,000 people that go, or kids that go to school. Can I give them sweaters? Can I, can I do something? And what can I do? So instead of always having these excuses, that we, we live in a poor country, we, we can't do anything, thank you very much for giving excuses, but excuses are like that. When you give an excuse of doing nothing, you wake up the next day and you are hungry. You have nothing to eat. Now I speak as someone that ever gone without food for two days. Some of the things they tell us that work, like tying your stomach with a bed when you are hungry, those things don't work. So wake up, go and work, do something, get your hands dirty. Okay, I'm going to ask a whole line of questions and I want quick responses. I'm sorry to put you on the spot like this. Is cryptocurrency a meaningful avenue to invest your money? No, for me. Long term, I think um, when there will be some successful cryptocurrencies. I think it's unavoidable. My view is that um, uh, this is where we are headed, uh, but not today. You can't discern which one is right. You can't discern which one is wrong. Therefore, for someone who is not willing to throw away their money, I mean, you shouldn't. But if you have some small amount to throw away and hope that there could be a huge windfall out of it, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps. But it's, it's a risky, very, very risky uh, investment that one, one would be making. Extremely risky. Okay, so you're saying don't totally rule it out. Livingstone is saying 
totally rule it yeah, out. Yeah, I think don't rule it out totally because That's uh, me. Okay. it's the same way people have always seen ideas that are novel. Okay. Yeah. The next question is, uh, how do I live below my means with children? Wouldn't that mean denying my children the basics in life? Please throw more light on that. They've sent that to you. Uh, a, a quick one. If you go into an organization, I'll show you three levels. There is the Ascari, there is the entry office or the banker clerk, that the, the banker teller, and there is the manager. Let's stop there. If you, you need to live below your means means that you, the bank manager of the branch manager, live like a teller, and the teller lives like an Ascari. Because eventually, what we are prescribing here looks like as prohibitive. But in actual sense, over time, it increases your ability to earn more and therefore improves your lifestyle. However, if you are the Ascari, you are at the floor of the feeding game. So the only game you have is to increase your, 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 your life, yeah, I mean, increase your income. And you have to work hard. I'm speaking as someone who started on 2,000 shillings a day. That's why it was my first pay. And even then in 2000, 2000 was still transport for 1,000 and, and lunch for 1,000. When you're at the bottom, there's nowhere else to go but up. Up, yeah. Okay. But also, um, wha what ha everyone has defined what they call their means differently, yeah, because everyone has their own definition. You may find that a holiday is, is, is something that's a requirement for someone, and so a requirement for the other one. So it's very, very um, personalized depending on the person. So you must be careful that whatever you're doing, at least you're putting aside some money. That's mm -hmm. what we call living a above your means, not necessarily below your means. You must put some money aside. As long as you're doing that, then you can party with the rest of the money. As long as the money you're putting aside could be sufficient to guarantee the life you want in retirement. Okay. Yeah. At 48 years, one has no investment because he cannot access extra money besides fees, rent, inherited responsibilities. Loans require security, which one doesn't have. How do you advise? Uh, stop being a savior for the world. That job was taken 2,000 years ago. He's, this is an African person. No, I'm, I'm <laughs> being realistic. We all know that struggle. No, no, no. I, I'm being... <laughs> <laughs> Josephine, I am being realistic. People are out playing severe. Everyone calls you, they want to borrow money, you give them. If your, your mother calls you, they want money, you give them. At Let me tell your you. your mother. No, no. It is her responsibility to save for her retirement. It's my responsibility to look after my kids. That's the, that's the reality. People like me have handed the right to say these things. We are not joking when we say your children should not be your retirement plan. If your mother now is trying to make a retirement plan from you, first take care of your kids. Mm. Because if we don't do these things and we don't share them out openly, we are creating cycles of poverty. Every generation is tied to the other. I am one of those sandwiched generations where your mother, you have looked after your parents, your siblings and your own children. And, and, and I have made a bet with myself. I will not call my ch children for, for me, them to support me. Let them send me something they have. But I am taking care of myself. And as you plan your money, please, as you pay school fees. This is an excuse. Sorry to wonder a little bit here. People are paying high school fees and therefore not saving enough for retirement because they expect the children to take care of them. No, take them in schools you can afford. And when I say you can afford, it is one month's income. Add all of your month's income. Now look at all the bills that came into, the, the reports that came for your table, for the kids that came from school. Look at the reports, add them together, see if one month's salary will pay school fees for the first term next year. If it can't, you are in schools you can't afford. Thank you very much. So I think uh, for me, <laughs> very interesting. But um, Karucha, it's very difficult to, def to say that you can't look after your mother, you That's can look true. after everyone. But um, in a simple sense, Everyone can start a business or can save some money if you checked how much you're receiving in terms of income vis-a-vis -vis your spending habits. Yeah, You could just adjust your spending habits within there and be able to save money. It's so typical, for instance now, that people are competing on the wrong things. Where the kids go to school? Yeah, My neighbor's kids go to international school. I also want mine to go to international school. Is it, is it what is best for them? Is it what, be, what is best for you to continue living your lifestyle as well? Is it what is best for your retirement goals. So if everyone checked their, their, their income against their expenses, you can put aside things that could help you start a goal. If you have 100,000, don't aim to start um, a company that makes plans. Yeah? Look, as he was emphasizing earlier in the beginning, look into those abilities of yours and then start something that is worth within those capital levels that you have. So you have to check both sides of the, of the balance sheet, the income against the expense, and see how you can moderate the two to talk to each other and then achieve your goals as well. All right. 
Um, the grand common question, especially for people in the ages of 30 to 35, what should one buy first between land and a car? And this question was sent to Ibrahim. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Josephine. It's a very interesting... I'll give a personal view, then I'll give what I think is a bit classic. Um, it's, it's very dependent. Now, to explain that, um, I'll start from... The, the land, as is it for building a home, is it as an investment? I'll use a home in actual sense. Yeah, I'll go beyond the land, land and talk about a home. Is that many, many, many corporates make the wrong decision, in my view, is that early in their lives, they spend on a home. Very early in their lives. Very early, they go and fork a mortgage. Let's say I earn two million a month. I fork a mortgage where I pay at least one million to, and then build a home. Remember, home is consumption. Yeah, because it's very difficult for someone to sell their home willingly unless they're moving into another better home or some sort of thing. So you take a mortgage, a massive mortgage, either or loan to buy land or a home. And then once you do that, you basically remain with a small amount of income, yeah, which cripples your ability to invest, not just in yourself, maybe through education or set up a business. So the ideal thing in my understanding is that you must first get some minimum level of wealth. Yeah, so that by the time you're taking a mortgage or by the time you're building this house, you can either pay it off very fast or you have other sources of what? Of income. The wrong thing is for you to take a mortgage early or make a major outflow, even if it's a capital outflow, which is not going to recoup or return that money very fast. Piece of land, you could sell it if it was for investment purposes. But once you build a, build a home on it and have a family, it becomes very difficult to walk out of the house because it's a consumption. A house is consumption. It's not an investment usually. So at age, at, within that age, my assumption is that someone has done something to build wealth. Something has been put in place. And once you do that, you can have both the home and the car with, with, with ease. This is not home. Yeah. This is land. Yes. But okay. the land assumption here is that typical land, most Ugandans are buying it for home. Okay. If you're buying it for investment, again, remember the how a car is consumption. It's pure consumption. It's comfort and everything, but it's consumption. While the land is an investment. We can't compare both things. Yeah, You're comparing consumption and then something that is an investment. They're not the same. But if it is a car and then land for home, both are consumption. Yeah. Although a home somehow depends on investment, because appreciates in value. While the car, the day it walks out of the bond, is the very day it begins reducing what value. So the issue for me is that build some minimum worth before beginning to try and enjoy the fruits of your of your sweat. Okay. Yeah. Car is prestige. Yeah. Land is. It's, it's an investment. Okay. Yeah. There is a possibility that low risk takers' time is a factor. I may take more time and you find it too late to risk and invest. You, the answer is true? Yeah, the answer is very true. Uh, you must, everyone in one way or the other, must pursue some risk. Because as you mentioned, risk is all over the place. I've seen very many low risk takers somehow trying to catch up later. It happens. So you were doing all these little things. It's like you were living on a paycheck. It's low risk. The biggest example is, let's say, if you're in a, gov a government job or a job that's very safe, that guarantees you your paycheck. That's low risk. That's an example of pursuing low risk. If you have a permanent contract which says that you cannot be sacked, you can't do anything, and then you sit in your desk every day and your paycheck at the end of every month, that is low risk. Now, after 25 years of work, now you're about 50, and you have to retire, you try to think, how can I catch up? It is too late. So. The everyone at a particular stage in life typically must pursue some risk because without pursuing any risk, you won't make any meaningful money. You'll just be a normal person, but not an above average person. Okay. Yeah. What investment avenues can someone put their money in with less risks and highly sustainable? Most importantly, those that cut across all professions. Uh, Ibrahim? Uh, uh, that, that question was answered. We identified the four areas where you need to invest. It's a question of how much you have, your risk appetite, and what you're willing to be able to, to lose at the end of the day. So I think when you go back to what we, we mentioned, the four areas, the real estate business, uh, fixed income, and insurance products, that's a space we have. So you're not going to, to be able to find another area. But I, I needed to add something on the home issue, because I think 
actually as you add someone has said how i wish livingstone can have a chance to respond to that question car or house or land personally i bought a car first okay. but the home is misrepresented because the home is not a purely economic good the home is a social good there is an aspect for example the decision when i decided to build a home one of the primary drivers of my decision was I needed a permanent address for my children. Now I can't quantify that in forms of money. However, the mistake we are making when it comes to building homes is that we are building our dream homes before we on, when we only need a place where to stay. So in other words, don't build, a, don't build a dream home when you are starting out. Build a home that simply takes you away from a rental to your own home. Functionality. Uh, functionality. That's the key point here. And then primarily, when you are building a home, I, I, I have built these pointers for people to remember. A home project should not cost you more than four years' income. Now, some of them are not, they, they are not in, they are not in what you call, embedded in I don't know, like, but if you remember in four years, because we know, when we are buying cars, especially with a man, when a man is buying his first car, anything that moves from point A to point B is what we buy. <laughs> that we know. Ibrahim, you can remember your first car. You simply just need anything that moves. That's the same with the house. Just get something that allows you to get away from home. Because when you are retiring at the latter age, I am a proponent of social security and I am embedded. I sit on the National Committee of the Social Insurance Committee for the Ministry of Gender. And these are the issues we grapple with. How do we prepare our people to be socially stable and secure in retirement? One of them is a home. And you should not uh, over and, uh, underestimate the power that a good home would give you to create more income. There are those with partners with a better financial muscle, but the partner fears to, test, to take risks. If I have an idea but without enough capital to invest, as a male, is it worth trying to sell the idea to a partner who fears risks? Anyway, I, I, I don't know, Ibrahim. I have already stated my case, so I'm already on the public square. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, many times, uh, the, age, the age group which I'm in, which is just near the 40s, uh, you've had friends um, tell me that their boyfriends or their husbands have, have actually wasted their money. I know a marriage personally. I know it vividly that broke down the cryptocurrency saga. Yeah? One had to leave because one, they both borrowed money from the bank and put in this one coin thing and lost the money. So they had to actually separate. Now, the point here is that uh, these things are more of the relationship itself and how you'd explain to the other party if at all the money was lost. Because this really happens, yeah? We always say in our profession that whenever you're investing someone's money, ask yourself, would you be comfortable with the decisions you're making if the other person was making them for you? Yeah, so speak to the partner and try to educate them about um, the goals that you want to pursue. Possibly, like how we say about uh, issues in relationship, that see a counselor, it's also sensible here to see uh, uh, an, an expert, mm -hmm. yeah, a financial expert. Why is that? It's very easy for us to visit doctors, yeah, it's very easy for us to visit um, um, many different forms of professionals, but not the financial experts who are all over the place. So, the starting point would be that you'd exonerate yourself of all the challenges that may come, if they are told they come, when someone else, an independent person owns them, than you owning them. Uh, Josephine, I want to raise a lady flag. Very quickly. Yeah, because I live in the market. Mm. People are investing when they are boyfriends and girlfriends, and they are buying land together and building <laughs> homes, when the papers are not in order. When you start investing with somebody, ask yourself, what is the contractual relationship between you? And when things split up, what happens? Because then he took my house, you know, we are just dating, I put in all my salary and it's all gone. Please look at the papers. Before you invest together, you married legally. And it might not even be that you put money. It might be that you spent days supervising the workers at the site. Whatever the case, so that's the lady the flag. two of you, who is a religious man? Because <laughs> this next question needs a religious person. And um, so who is, who is religious? I think we are both religious. You're both wonderful. Yeah. So this question... How do I mitigate against family curses? I've had every advantage in life, but I can't seem to get ahead. My mom says it's a curse from my father's lineage and advises I go to Mutuinde. What's Mutuinde? What's your take? Okay, okay. Now you're still progressing. 
<laughs> I, I started life with a family curse. <laughs> my family, nobody had finished senior four. Nobody had ever gone to senior six. Nobody has ever gone to college. Nobody had ever bought a car. Nobody had ever built a home with, with, with iron sheets. Eh? This one of what we call insane on the street. So literally, I had my cars. But the question is, just know where you're coming from. And know what you need to break through. And then remember, you are not going to save all the poor people in your family. Did you go to Mutuwindo? <laughs> I don't need to go to Mutuwindo. <laughs> Uh, I think these questions require prophets. <laughs> uh, they are quite. But I, I am a man of faith. I think for me, faith yeah. has been critical. They are quite Wh why, why, I, why I, I want to, to put in the point of faith? There is a, a component of faith that comes to the public square, as I call it, that when you are socially stabilized, that you are not womanizing, that you are, you are not a drunkard, that the social scenes that normally take your money, faith has helped you heal them. Okay. Yeah. You do better. So this curse, let's let's assume it's not a curse. What else could it be? Mistakes, typically. Um, it could be that you're making mistakes and you're not looking at yourself. You're looking at the curse, which you don't know whether it exists or it doesn't exist. <laughs> Look into your own self. Let me tell you, um, typically, most investors will, not, will always look for who to blame than look at themselves. What have I been doing wrong consistently? There may be something you're doing wrong consistently because as we said, learn. So that thing that makes you make mistakes is, is, is very constant in your life. So for me, in that, uh, the simplest is look at the, the chain of decisions you've been making, that very chain, and you look for things that you could have done different. Consult someone else to look it out for you because we normally want to look at ourselves in a very, very nice way. Talk to someone else independent and ask them this is what I've been doing da, 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 over time. Don't tell them about your curse, the, your assumed curse or perhaps if it doesn't exist. Talk to them, talk to another person. They will see what you're not seeing. Yeah. So for me, it's about looking at the decisions I've been making over time or they've been making over time and you look for errors to correct over time in those, in those decisions. Uh, but but uh, we have to admit that Pastor Tom Mugerua is doing a, a good job of counseling. At least I've been to that church. Okay. So it's a counseling... Basically, someone needs to talk to that person. I was going to, to say, sometimes, uh, and there's a Bible verse that says, the thing that you fear the most, you become it. Your focus is on yeah. on this poverty, yeah. all the issues in yeah. your family, and so you yeah. you start to manifest that yeah. thing that you yeah. fear, yeah. and you know you become yeah. it. So true, true. Uh, the pastors, the priests, and so on are a good place to go for yeah. That kind of counsel. Yeah, but if they don't exacerbate the problem by telling that indeed there is a curse, you have to deal with yourself, I think, at some point. Okay. Yeah. Next question. Kindly discuss relationship between risk, budgets, plans, and expenditure in business. Risk, budgets, plans, and expenditure in business. I, I'm sorry to say, we normally have questions. Uh, it's a good question because you have to budget for your money. You have to have a, a good... By the way, people have a bad relationship with money. And uh, some of them, not all of them. Because every time money comes to them, it's like it's a race to spend it. It's money that is hot in their... In their I, I wish I had Burning two minutes. The hole. I would tell you a story, but I don't think there is two minutes for this. But my point is that your relationship with money is, is important. Are you comfortable holding a million shillings on your account for two months and not spend it? Because if you, do, you have a poor relationship with money, every time you see something, you want to spend it. And that's where comes my, one of my slogans, that just because you can afford something doesn't mean you should buy it. Okay. So uh, budgets and plans are risk management tools. Yeah? Any sensible person, either business, at all levels, individual, business, country level, we must budget and plan as a way of managing our risks. Because the budget will lay out the things you can do and things you can't do. The plan is the bigger thing, the granular thing, then the budget drives from the plan. But all these are tools to manage risk. And that's what we were talking about earlier, that your income against your expenses. That is a simple way of budgeting. But in actual sense, you're trying to manage your risk and return goals very, very precisely. And, and probably maybe to a quick one, and it's important for our viewers, that if you look at your savings as painful, you try to avoid them because you look at savings as something that has been denied to you. So you avoid them. So every time you have money coming in, get your income, take off your savings, and whatever, whatever is left is what you spend. 
you always have savings. But if you get income and take off expenditure, usually there are no savings. So if you see savings as painful, you avoid it. But if you see it as a way to buy your freedom, to become a better economic player in the market, then it was something that you eagerly look out for. Mindset. Ibrahim, the next question is directly for you. Kindly share with us options for investment with manageable risk. Yeah, we have shared those. Um, again, I'll be I'll be broad and and answer that one. Technical, that one way I would avoid it, but I will broadly answer it. There are many in the market, and the interesting one is government bonds. Yeah, it's the easiest. Anyone with a hundred thousand Uganda shilling can buy a bond. Just walk into any bank in this market, tell them I want to open a bond a bond a bond account. Let me use that word to be precise. And with a hundred thousand shillings every month. Or every week, if you wanted, every week you can buy a bond and build a portfolio. Interestingly, is that bond returns are very decent in this market. That's a whole story of another day. In actual sense, sometimes outperforming some aspects of uh, of real estate, yeah, but not entirely all aspects of real estate. So, bonds are the easiest. I'm talking about formal investments now. The second could be buying shares. Those are long term. Once you buy a share, don't go looking everywhere at the price closed. You get a heart attack. But long term, if you have your long term goals, yes, then shares could make sense across East Africa. You can buy Ugandan ones, you can buy Kenyan ones across East Africa and even beyond beyond East Africa, depending on your people you're speaking to, the experts and wealth. So the, the then there is real estate, which is the commonest. Real estate has so many classes within it. It has the raw land, which is again behaves more like shares. It's more of long term. Uh, but with a bit of uh, a protection downside. You have uh, income generating real estate like properties which people have. So depending on the goals, these alone don't make you money, but depending on their goals, you choose a particular investment based on what you want to achieve. The investment is an enabler to achieve your goal. It is not the goal, but what you want to, to achieve. So you could do fixed income, the so-called bonds. You could do equities, shares in the companies, or you could do alternatives, including real estate, as an example. A question. Yeah. Um, your thoughts on the forex market? Someone wants to know. And while you get to that answer, the best time to start investing, and then we'll close. All right. Uh, speculative again. Uh, most people uh, want. They've seen, for instance, a few months ago, what three, four fifty of the UGX, and now it's been flatting with the near three nine a couple of uh, weeks ago. So people are saying, oh, let me buy forex. Yeah, hold it and then pass it on. It's very speculative things. It's very speculative. It's very tricky. Uh, I always say uh, buy forex when you can actually uh, create value out of forex, not necessarily waiting for when the price will move for you to make money. Or when you even understand it, yeah. usually we just jump on the bandwagon. Uh, and and uh, beautiful question: When to start investing? As soon as you get an income, and even if that is thirteen years, once you start getting an income, whether you're being given money. That's the time to start investing. Thank but you. if you did not invest yesterday, the best time to start is today. Thank you very much, both of you. I now declare the panel session. Thank you so much, Josephine. Thank you so much, Ibra and Livingstone, for this very deep insights. I stand here as a junior headmaster for now. Uh, he left to do a some business and I'm taking over for him. I was waiting, I, I, in fact, I'm still waiting that uh, you recommend a book so that this conversation, each of our panelists, Livingstone, Ibra, and I'm also wanting to ask Josephine, but for now, let me excuse you. So this conversation can continue even after here. Thank you. Uh, I'll go first because I'm an author. Uh, I've authored two books. The 2015 I wrote Investing for the Future. It's a must read for anyone planning to read in Uganda. Been quite probably 5,000 copies sold. Uh, then The Great Financial Rebuild is my second book came out in 2020. But outside of my books, I would recommend The Richest Man in Babylon. Mm. It will teach you some hard truth about building wealth. Thank you. So um, I'll be a bit more pragmatic here and uh, don't recommend a special book. But I would recommend that people pay attention to what appears in particularly the dailies. Yeah. For me, those are the books I'm recommending. Um, particularly like the Thursday New Vision and the Monitor. They have these series they run about different businesses in the country. Yeah, agriculture in particular. Uh, different aspects of business. 
if you paid attention critically, uh, these are the areas we normally go to invest. And they share stories that relate with us. Yeah, I put money in Kayunga, I put money in, uh, in, uh, in Gomba, and stuff like that. These diaries actually have very beautiful stories. Uh, most of our TV channels, if you picked, uh, and radios, if you picked part of the, of, the, of, the, of the programs that they have, almost all of them have these real life things that you relate with. If you go very exotic, you will actually have ideas that sometimes don't let easily hear. But these are very good grounds, I mean, sorry, grounded stories that could help us to actually build our investment lives better, prepare for retirement, and perhaps also create wealth, because um, wealth is necessary for you to live a happy life. Thank you. Thank you, Ibra. This conversation must continue. We will continue talking about risk, return, and the age story. I, for one, I have learned from Livingstone that in order for me to build any appetite for risk, I must cure the food appetite, the food war. It's hard for me to think about risking money anywhere when I'm still hungry, you know. The discussion is really just about food. What are we having for dinner? So thank you, Livingstone, for that. And I've learned from Ibra that quick wealth is a joke. Uh, if we are trying to crack jokes, we should consider quick wealth, and there we will laugh. There is no quick and guaranteed return and such things. So thank you so much, Ibra and uh, Livingstone. Thank you, Josephine. It is hard for me to finish any session without talking about the NSSF Voluntary Contributions Platform. We have an avenue for all our savers to add to their contributions. We've been talking about increasing the saving. There is the mandatory 15%. And for many people in the informal sector, they're not saving anything. So we have a voluntary contribution platform where all Ugandans are invited to contribute. And with the voluntary contributions, there is no minimum. Like the, there is no 15% because you decide what you want to save for yourselves, okay? So visit our platforms, visit the website, uh, check on our NSSF Go app. That's where our information is. Thank you so much, everybody, for attending. Thank you, our viewers. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Mr. Edmaster, in your absence. Have a good evening. Bye.